In my previous video, I said that a magnetized object will actually affect the light that is reflected off its surface. And I've spent a lot of time searching for a way that I can capture this on video and show it to you. And so today I was finally successful. Here's the setup. We've got a polarized light source shining down on this computer storage disk. And then the camera is looking down through another polarizer at the spot on the disk. And the two polarizers are oriented such that very little light is making it through. So the polarizers are crossed. And then I've got one of those evil scary magnets underneath the disk so that the field is facing up through the disk. And then I've got a laser pointer with a lens that's purposefully skewed on it. So that when I shine the laser through here, I end up with sort of like a cat's eye spot, like an elongated dot. Okay, so now take a look what happens when I shine the laser on the disk. Pretty cool, right? I mean, you can see there's a temporary effect. So the laser is actually heating up the disk, which is polycarbonate, and thermally stressing it, which is what's causing that temporary effect. But check it out, there's actually a permanent effect too. So after the laser spot has moved on, you'll see that the disk actually retains sort of a track of where the laser has been. Pretty neat. Now I tried to control very carefully for this. At first I thought it's probably a thermal effect. It's probably not the real magneto-optical Kerr effect. So I removed the magnet and repeated exactly the same thing. This is the same setup, the same laser, same lens at the same angle, everything. And as you can see, without the magnet in place, when I bring the laser over the disc, there's no permanent uh, effect. So you can still see the temporary effect, so it's still heating the disc up because the laser is focused to a tight spot, but it's not creating tracks like it was with the magnet in place. And I've gone back and forth many times and I've convinced myself that this is the real magneto-optical effect. Uh, but I wouldn't be too surprised if there was something else going on here because the magneto-optical effect is so weak. So let's talk about what's actually going on with this storage disk. Let me just get the magnet out of the way and uh, we can talk about what this disk is. So as you can see, it is a magneto-optical disk. And this was developed before DVDs were out, and um, you know at the time 2.6 gigabytes was actually pretty good. Uh, in fact, these came up to 5.2 gigabytes in size, which was you know, it's massive. I mean, you could almost put your whole hard drive on that. Um, so the designers of this format were uh, trying to accomplish something else. So unlike a CD-ROM or a DVD drive that have spiral cut tracks, this disk actually has a bunch of concentric individual tracks, and so this functions a lot more like a hard drive than it does a CD or a DVD disk. Uh, it's random access, so you can put this in the drive and then treat it just as if it were like a hard drive. It's just very, you know, it's just slower. Uh, but again, at the time, the storage was just great. In fact, I have a lot of experience with these. When I was an intern, I spent many, many hours copying files on and off of these disks. Uh, so it's it's not the first time that I've held one of these. Although I did get this off of eBay for five bucks or something like that. The problem, of course, is that we want a really robust format. So the, the disk is very easy to put in and out of the drive. It's not very sensitive to dust and all that kind of stuff. But we also want to store a lot of data on this. So at the time there was uh, something called the Jazz Drive, which was made by iOmega. And that was like a removable hard drive, where the platter was actually just like a hard disk platter. You'd pull it out of the drive and you know, put another one in. And that was pretty expensive and prone to failure. So an optical storage method would beat it in terms of robustness and reliability. But then the density wasn't quite as high and the rewritability was really difficult. So the reason that they went through all the trouble of coming up with this magneto-optical style is to have random access and high density and robustness. Here's a cross-section of the disk, and pretty much all the magic happens in this magneto-optical layer. So let's first talk about uh, what we do to read out of the disk. So let's pretend the disk already has data on it. The data is stored in uh, bits, just sort of like pits and lands on a CD in this layer, and they are set up such that uh, some of the magnetization is up or down. So pretend each one of these is a bit domain. So we have up magnetization and then down, down, and then up. So as we just saw at the beginning of the video, if we shine a polarized light on here, if the magnetization is in a different, is up, let's just say, the uh, amount of light we get back through the polarizer is different. So it basically works just like a CD. And if we focus our light down, we can read just one track at a time, just like a CD. 
and uh, we get, you know, flickering light. So the fact is that the, this changes the polarization, you know, that light comes in, and if the magnetization is up or down, the polarization will shift direction a little bit. But if we have our polarizers crossed so that it's very dark, then that changes the amount of light going through. Okay, fair enough. So, you know, at this point it works just like a CD. Now we want to go to write to it. We have a couple options. What we can do is submerge this entire thing in a bulk magnetic field, like a huge magnetic field, like I was doing with the, the big scary you know, neodymium magnet. And then what we can do is shine a laser in here, a much more powerful laser than the reading laser. And if the laser heats up this MO layer to its Curie point, which is the point at which it loses magnetism and it's in this giant magnetic field, when it cools down again it will assume the magnetization direction that this big field was pushing onto it. So let's say we wanted to turn all this into up magnetization. We would set up the external field so that everything is going up and then we would turn on this a powerful laser and burn all this, heat it up past the Curie point which is about 200 C for this material and then as it cools back down all of these would be facing up. So to get a little bit more fancy, what we could do is flip the magnet field back and forth as we're burning along with this powerful laser, and we could actually flip the domains into the spots we want them as we're going along. Alternatively, what we could do is also first just level the track, so we could have constant magnetic field, and then come along with our laser that's just constantly on and make all these face up or down. Then what we could do is flip the magnetic field once, and then come back and just turn on the laser just where we want to alter the field. So as this thing is going along, let's say they're all starting off in the up direction, we would have laser off and then turn the laser on here and here to flip these to the down direction. So the benefit of this, of course, is that we don't have to change the magnetic field very quickly. What we can do is just first clear the track, and then flip the magnetic field and come back and just turn the laser on and off very quickly. So this actually solves a lot of problems, even though it seems like kind of a complicated system. The material in the magneto-optical layer is quite special indeed. In fact, it's even probably more than one layer inside here. And one layer takes care of this magneto-optical readout, so not, not many, very many materials have uh, this Kerr effect that's easy to see. Uh, it's a very small effect, and so the material has to be chosen so that it will give a nice big polarization rotation. But then we also want a material that's easy to magnetize, kind of like a floppy disk. So they actually use multiple materials in here to get both uh, parts, storage and readout. And then I believe the silicon nitride layers are just insulators, basically. Since we have to get this middle layer up to, you know, 200 degrees C uh, for it to change magnetization direction, we sort of have to insulate it from the stuff around it and also prevent the polycarbonate from melting if it's in direct contact. This is a 5 milliwatt laser from eBay. I've actually measured these at about 250 milliwatt, and so the reason that I've slanted the lens off to one side is to make uh, a more oblong spot. If the lens is straight on, the spot is truly, you know, round, it's very well focused, and it actually burns the disc. It literally melts it and destroys the uh, internal structure of the disc. So I don't want to do that, I just want to heat it up to the Curie point. So I tilted the lens off at an angle so that my focal spot is stretched out. One, so that it's easier to see because it's a bigger spot, but also the energy density is a bit lower so that I don't physically melt the disc. I tried to demonstrate the magneto-optical effect with just ceramic magnets, and I tried a lot of different magnets with many different materials and coatings and everything, and I couldn't get any of it to work. Um, not too surprising, like I say, the compounds that they use to make this disc are not at all common. And I'll put the link in the description with more info. Uh, but if you could do this with just plain old nickel or whatever, uh, the designers would not go through all the trouble to make this very interesting layer that works in the disc. Another interesting example of the magneto-optical storage technique is the Sony Mini Disc. Some of you will probably remember that. I think it was actually more popular in Japan. Uh, but anyway, the bitrate was so low on those, uh, that one worked just by turning the laser on constantly and then flipping the magnetic field back and forth. But the mini disc, along uh, just like this, is a random access device, so you could actually record over it and you know, change the tracks later, unlike a CD. This was invented in the days before thumb drives, of course, so as soon as you were able to get multiple gigabytes on a solid-state device and just plug it into your computer, this thing pretty much became useless. Okay, see you next time. Bye.